Here on the workbench today, I have another budget handheld oscilloscope, and this one is an MDS120MC2 by Mustool. It is a dual channel scope, claims to have a single channel bandwidth of 120 MHz and dual channel bandwidth of 40 MHz, and it also has a rather rudimentary function generator built in. On this channel, I have reviewed many cheap handheld multifunctional devices by now, and in this video, let's find out how well this MDS120MC2 works. Banggood provided me this unit for review. As usual, I will leave a product link and a coupon code in the video description below for those who are interested in getting one after watching this video. The first thing I should note is that it's a very compact device. For size comparison, here on its side is a ZT703S I just reviewed not too long ago, and you can just see how small this MDS120MC2 is. This small form factor definitely comes with some sacrifice. It only has a 2.8 inch screen, which is pretty small. The screen resolution is 320 by 240. And if you look at the top here, you can see that all the connectors here are MCX ones instead of the standard BNCs. You know my opinion on this. To me, I would prefer BNC connectors, especially for the oscilloscope channels, even if they have to make the device a little bigger. In fact, the Dream Source Labs DS401012 is of the same dimension, length, and width width. Of course, the Dream Source Lab scope is a lot thinner, but it has standard input BNCs here. Anyway, without the BNCs, nothing is protruding from the top, so it's less likely to bump into something that would damage the connectors and make the device slightly more portable. But like I mentioned before, you pretty much have to remember to bring your own oscilloscope probes with you, as very likely you are not able to find a probe with an MCX connector when you need it. The scope also feels very light. According to the specifications, it weighs only 187 grams. Now, here's something for a change. If you look at the bottom here, you can see that we have a physical power button. I actually like that, as some devices I reviewed have rather high power drain, even when turned off. And you sometimes find yourself in a situation when you wanted to use a device, but the battery is dead. With a physical button, you won't have that problem. In the product box, you get a scope itself, you also get the manual two sets of these 100 MHz bandwidth probes. Now, these are not marked, but according to the manual, these are indeed 100 MHz. For a scope that is rated for 120 MHz bandwidth in single channel mode, I would have expected a 150 MHz probe. So I suspect the bandwidth claim is probably borderline at best. Of course, we'll have to check that out shortly. You also have a soft carrying pouch, a MCX to alligator clips for the signal generator, some accessories, and a USB-C cable here. By the way, you do get two sets of the oscilloscope probes. Now, I do think, unfortunately, bandwidth had become the main feature being advertised by a lot of entry-level oscilloscopes. It's kind of like the megapixel advertisement for digital cameras. You know it can be very misleading. With a good oscilloscope, even a 10 MHz bandwidth is sufficient for a lot of the hobby work. When I got started some 40 years ago, I just had a single channel 10 MHz analog scope, and I used that scope for more than 10 years before moving on to something better. All right, I digressed. Let me power it on. Oh wait, the put-up screen looks very familiar. I think it's the same as the ETA29 scope meter I reviewed a while back. Let's just do a quick look at that meter. And here is the ETA29 that I reviewed way back. And let's power it on and see. Yeah, you can see that the splash screen looks exactly the same as what we have on this MDS. Anyway, that just tells you that a lot of these Chinese brands have very similar, if not exactly the same underlying hardware and software design. They're just different brands. I just hooked up a test signal that is roughly 1 volt RMS and it's at 1 MHz. And let's take a look at how easy it is to use this oscilloscope. Let me automatically acquire the signal first. And no problem, we acquired the signal. Of course, we can also change the time base by manually adjusting these buttons. And also we can change the attenuation by changing these two vertical buttons. One issue most of these cheap scope meters have in common is its low input sensitivity. Here, we're at the highest input sensitivity. You can see it's only at 50 millivolts per division for a times 1 probe. By the way, the actual probe itself were adjusted to times 10. 
And here we can actually adjust the oscilloscope setting independently. We can, for example, press this times one times 10 button to switch between the times one and times 10 setting. So the 50 millivolts per division sensitivity is actually quite low. A typical low end benchtop oscilloscope can go down to at least two millivolts per division. So just something to keep in mind. And that's our one microhertz sinusoidal. Let's change it to a square wave, triangular wave, and you get an idea. And you notice that the waveform is not entirely stable. That unfortunately has something to do with the triggering circuitry of the oscilloscope. And if I decrease the output frequency from the signal generator, it probably will get a little bit more stable. Let's change it to say one kilohertz, one kilohertz. And let's reacquire signal. Yeah, you can see that at low frequencies, typically these cheap scopes are able to acquire the signal with no problem. But at higher frequencies, you usually do get some stability of the waveform display issue. So you can see that at low frequencies, the waveform display is very stable. And as I said earlier, the controls are very intuitive. You can actually, for example, hit the mode. Now you can actually move the waveforms around and you hit the mode again. Now you can change the verticals and horizontals. Of course, you can also adjust the trigger. So here's a single trigger, here's normal, here's your auto trigger, and adjust the edge of the triggering. So all these are standard and also very easy to use. Next, I do want to verify its bandwidth claim. With a maximum sampling rate of 500 mega samples per second, I suppose it could do 120 megahertz if you use four points per cycle and interpolate a sinusoidal. But typically, you need around 10 points to get a high fidelity captured signal. So even if you could achieve the 120 megahertz claimed bandwidth, the signal quality probably won't be that great. Unfortunately, the setup here is not ideal for the bandwidth measurement because I don't have a proper MCX to BNC cable here, so I have to use this probe to clip onto the banana clips. So definitely the impedance matching here will be very poor. I would ask you to ignore the amplitude changes just to concentrate on the acquired signal quality here. So let's switch it back to sinusoidal. Right now we're at one kilohertz. So let's actually change it to one megahertz to begin with one megahertz. So this scope also has some issue with acquiring a signal outside its frequency range. You can see here, we are not able to capture that signal correctly. And this is something that I mentioned in my previous scope review. But this one, at least you can see the signal is moving. Definitely, you need to adjust the time base to ensure the signal is displayed properly. Anyway, so let's change it to 10 megahertz. And let's reacquire signal. And you can see we have no problem. Now let's change it to 20, 30, 40, 50. Ugh. At 50 megahertz, you can see the signal doesn't really look like a sinusoidal anymore. Let's change the time base. Okay, so that is still okay. Let's increase to 70 megahertz, and that's the highest I can go with this 01 DG2070. And you can see that at 70 megahertz, the signal becomes a little bit wobbly here. It's already not ideal, but we do get the measurement here of the signal frequency and the current amplitude. So let me actually push it a little bit further with my 8642B signal generator. Just one moment. Then I just powered on my HP 8642B. Right now the output is at 70 megahertz, and you can see that the signal is a little bit wobbly as we saw before. So now let me increase the frequency a little bit more to 80 megahertz. Right now it's 80. Okay, still able to display. Let's do 90. That is still okay. So let's see, yep, that's the fastest time base already. Let's do 100. And we see the amplitude dropped significantly. Of course, that also could be the impedance mismatch we mentioned earlier. So this is 100 megahertz. You can see that the frequency counter picked up the frequency with no problem. 110. Let me increase the output amplitude a little bit as we can't really see the signal here. 
So now we can see the signal here and let's increase it to 120. Yeah, the amplitude started to become unstable here, but we are able to capture that 120 macros. So let's increase a little bit more, 125. Yeah, so you can see that we're not able to measure it. 120 probably is really pushing it, but we are able to display it. So here we are dialing back to 110. You can see we can display that 110 megahertz relatively stable here. But at 120 megahertz, it becomes a little bit unstable. All right, now I swapped back to the O1DG 2070, and we're currently seeing a 70 megahertz signal here. And as you saw earlier, the scope was able to pick up that 120 megahertz signal, but it was just barely. Now let's take a look at the dual channel bandwidth. Remember, the single channel bandwidth is specified at 120 megahertz, and the dual channel bandwidth is specified at 40 megahertz. Typically, the bandwidth is cut by half when the ADC is shared by both input channels. But in this case, the bandwidth is actually cut to one third. So not sure why that's the case. Perhaps there's some limitation on the FPGA side that cannot process the information from both channels simultaneously at a high sampling rate. And that's just my guess. So let me enable channel two. To enable channel two, we just need to press and hold the F2 here. So now channel two is enabled. And of course, we're displaying both channels. And you can see that definitely we have some degradation of the first channel. Right now, we're at 70 megahertz. Obviously, even the frequency counter is having trouble picking up that signal. So let's reduce that signal a little bit. 60, 50, 40. Yeah, definitely we're able to display the 40 megahertz signal here. So let's do 41. Yeah, we can push a little bit, 42, 43, 44, and you can see that the signal becomes heavily distorted at this point. 46, 47, 48, yeah. So definitely the 40 megahertz looks about accurate here. It's a pity that you can't use this scope for XY mode, even though it has two channels. Now, this is more of a software or firmware issue, in my opinion, than anything else. As if you can sample both channels at the same time, you should be able to do the XY plot. Now let's do a single shot capture. It didn't really say in the manual what the memory depth is, but it did say that it has 12.8 division of storage depth. So we should be able to do a single shot capture here. So let me give it a go. By the way, for the setup, I have hooked it up to a power supply. So right now the output is off. Let me turn on output and let's see if we can capture the results here. And this is the powering on characteristics of the power supply captured at 10 milliseconds per division. And very briefly, let's take a look at the function generator capability here. As I mentioned earlier, we do have a built-in function generator and you can see here, the output currently is on. So I think to get to the function generator, we have to go to the menu and we have to come down here. And you can see we do have the gen output. So that's our generator. Now, as I mentioned, it is very rudimentary. You can see here, we currently have a square wave output and we can change it to, let's see the frequency here. Yeah, you can see we can select these discrete frequencies. Two kilohertz, that shouldn't be a problem. Let's go back to one kilohertz. And of course, we can also select, I assume, the output voltage here. And again, here you can see we only have a few discrete values to select from. Let's take a look at the waveform options here. Now we can select a ramp signal. And again, we have, I assume, some discrete frequency levels. Yep. And let's see what else. We have a sinusoidal. And that's about it. Of course, when we're in square wave, you can also change the duty cycle, I assume. Let's see here. Yep. Let's do 10%. That is not a problem. But you can see that this function generator capability is fairly bearable. All right, time to open it up and see what's inside. And by the way, we do have the stand at the back. I forgot to mention earlier. Let's actually take a look at the current consumption first. And you can see we're drawing about 280 milliamps. So that will give you 
probably around 10 hours runtime, depends on how big the battery is. Let's see if we can tell. This is just a standard 18650 cell here. Now, this is a protection circuitry on the battery itself. So the runtime really depends on the capacity of this battery. And here is a close-up of the circuit board. And you can see from the silk screen, it says it's ET120C2. And this one is made by E1. So presumably this one is sold also by other brands as well, as we had suspected early on. And this specific model is Moss2 branded. And you can see that the overall layout is very simple. We don't have a lot of components here, and also we don't have shielding cans even for the input channels. Here are the two input channels. We only have a single trim cap for each of the input channels for adjustments. By the look of it, here is a solid state relay, and here is a relay for the input range switching. And here we have a few MUXs, as you can expect from a typical oscilloscope input section. Towards the middle here, you can see that's our MCU. And the chip used here is a 32F427, which is nothing special. And down here, that's our companion flash memory. Right above the microcontroller, that's our analog to digital converter. And the chip used here is an MXT2088. Now, interestingly, this chip is only spec for a maximum sampling rate of 100 max samples per second. Now, if you look at the spec of the scope, it says it's 500 max samples per second. So I don't know how they can achieve 500 max samples per second with a 100 max samples per second ADC. So presumably they're doing some kind of time equivalent sampling here, and also perhaps overclocked ADC quite a bit. So realistically, the actual bandwidth of the scope is probably kept somewhere around 40 megahertz. And if you look at the circuit board, everything is built down to a cost for this specific model. So here are some of my parting thoughts. The positioning of the scope is clearly aimed at entry level, and it is fairly inexpensive. So if you need a beginner scope with slightly higher bandwidth and don't mind the MCX connectors, and size is a deciding factor, this scope might fit your needs. Nowadays, the competition in the low-end market is quite fierce, and you can check out my other oscilloscope review videos if you want to see how this one stacks up with others in a similar price range. I will leave a few links in the video description below, but do leave me a comment in the comment section below and let me know what you think about this oscilloscope. Anyway, if you liked the video, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this in the future. Your participation makes videos like this possible. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.